We're in business to save the planet, and we use making clothes to do that. The cure for depression is action. Every one of us has to step up and do what you can according to what your resources are. All right, how's it going? That was the voice of Patagonia's Yvonne Chouinard. Welcome to Type 2, the podcast from Looking Sideways in association with Patagonia that explores the intersection between outdoors, action sports and activism. We're on episode 11 and in the previous 10 episodes I've been meeting people who are using their passion and involvement with the cultures we all love to create change. I've been discussing the issues they're involved in, the change they're seeking to create, the difficulties involved and the rewards that follow. Now this week's guest is Dan Crockett. Dan is a writer, journalist and activist from the UK who is currently Development Director of the Blue Marine Foundation. Blue Marine Foundation is a charity dedicated to restoring the ocean to health, as their mission statement puts it, and they do so by supporting various different projects, one of which is the recent virtual Rewilding the Sea conference, which brought together different interested parties in an attempt to further the conversation around the topic of marine rewilding and restoration. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept of rewilding, their work's a great way in. Basically, rewilding is the concept of restoring large-scale ecosystems terrestrially and in the marine environment, and also by reintroducing natural processes and missing species to a landscape. And the idea is to allow nature to take care of itself something we discuss in detail during our conversation and we also discuss the controversies around the concept of rewilding which is a pretty contentious issue at the moment in the ecological sphere. Dan is also heavily involved in the drive to introduce marine national parks to the UK coastline which is an attempt as he explained to reset our own relationship with the marine environment that is such an important and integral part of everybody's life in the UK. Now, of course, as regular listeners of Type 2 will know, we also explored Dan's own story, including how he ended up working on such innovative and passion-driven projects and the thread that links his work, which is basically the intimacy of the human relationship with the sea and our changing attitudes to the marine environment. It's a really lovely, reflective conversation, this one with a nuanced thinker and a generous conversationalist. I enjoyed it very much. Hope you do too. Thanks to Dan for sharing his insights with us. Here's me and Dan Crockett. Enjoy. How are you, Dan? Pretty good, mate, yeah. We're rolling. This is it. It's happening. Exciting. Yeah, how's your day? Yeah, it was good. It's a bit of a um, Zoom and teams marathon at the moment which is yeah which is quite odd because it you get all of the human uh stress but you don't get any of the warmth of actually seeing humans uh yeah but but we, it feels like it you also not burning it you know any carbon so it's it's kind of good um yeah i found there are pros and cons to it it's really changed my working day which has been very a very positive development i think because i've ended up blocking out work i basically I used to have an office that i would go to with the people i work with and you know i'd kind of do like a normal working day and what i found now is i do a block like sort of nine till eleven thirty, and then a block from like two till five and it's much more productive and kind of suits my how i want to work a bit a bit more but equally the remoteness is quite strange isn't it of 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 like actually just being digital when you're talking to people it's odd yeah and there's the thing about the in, environmental space is, is quite a fundamental paradox where a lot of people fly all over the world all the time to talk about this stuff um and it's it's quite odd you know there's people who are sort of travel for 300 plus days of the year and they're right in the center of of conversations about the future of the ocean but there, there is a bit of a paradox to it. And I think this is potentially a route to overcoming that and, and working in this space in a more authentic way. So I think it's, I think there's a lot of potential in it, as you said. Do you think, is that in that industry and community, is that a habit thing? As in that, that like that, that propensity and, and 
the cycle of travel that is that is that just something that people have always done because it's like conference based yeah i think it's a human habit thing i think i i don't know because i'm not involved in them but i'd imagine that you know whether you work in kind of um the lawnmower industry or um you know just looking around me the guitar industry you probably fly all over the world talking to other guitar makers or um yeah and and that's sort of the done thing um and it's really been interesting to just to see that completely inverted um on the flip side it's 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 also a bit of a bummer um because this year was supposed to be the super year for the ocean um and there were these series of quite big events some of which have been sort of in train for 20 years uh, and most of them have been cancelled um or or at the right. very least postponed okay so a good point to mention the work you're doing and see so it's it's a job isn't it that you're working for an organization um and you've just helped organize the rewild in the sea conference so maybe if you tell us a little bit about your your role and, and, the, and the work of the organization yeah so i work um with a charity called blue marine foundation um and i'm the development director um which which gives me quite a broad remit really um i both help to support projects by raising money um but i also have several projects that i run myself um one of them's around trying to create national parks in the sea uh, and the other one's focused on high seas conservation um but it's a it's a really interesting role because it sort of gets me in the middle of all of these different conversations and quite often that's not just with a financial hat on it's uh you know it's it's a it's a really interesting space and you know the deeper you go into it the more you realize there's a lot of people who've dev devoted their whole lives to very rarefied things um you know last night i was having a conversation with someone um specifically about antarctica and the different processes that are potentially in place to protect it and you realize the depth of people's passion and how far they've gone into these 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 different uh very rarefied things that from the outside world you don't even know are going on or, yeah. or exist and yet some of them are to determine the future of you know the high seas for instance was something i'm working on is 45 percent of earth's surface um and it's it's all kind of the future of it's all discussed in these kind of quite closed stuffy rooms <laughs> yeah, and no right. one really knows what's going on despite it being the common heritage of humankind so we all have a stake in it and certainly you know for our future we all have a stake in it so what what's the goal of the organization can it can it be pinned down to one one goal yeah a healthy ocean really is 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 where we're coming from um and there's two sort of subsets to that first is to try and protect 30 percent by 2030 and the second is to ensure sustainable management of the remaining 70 percent um and that can include restoration um so the the conference you mentioned rewilding the sea was uh specifically about that really you know what what can you do to bring the ocean back to health and you know we had two sort of strands the first about protecting it and the second about what you know what can you actively put back in uh to make a difference um and yeah it was a it was a really cool day so it's a double approach then it's protect so protection would is that the national park work that you would that you that you mentioned is that essentially like allocating areas that you can presumably you know ensure industry stay out of and just try and you know leave it in the same way that we have national parks on land you you, you basically protect an area in that way and then the second way as you say is regeneration so again um picking an area where you try and because i mean it might be a good point to talk about the concept of rewilding which is essentially trying to as i understand it um, regenerate ecosystems and species right that have been threatened by um human impact is that is that a good summary yeah i mean it's very much a terrestrial term to date um you know rewilding. i'd never heard of it in a marine environment actually or context until we started talking and i saw the work you were doing 
Yeah, and I was quite interested to, to sort of bring it to the marine space. And, you know, people in the marine space talk a lot about ecosystem restoration and other, other you know, terms that are, I guess, fairly alienating. Um, and that's a, the, the national parks related work that I'm trying to do is very much along those lines too. I mean, we have tons of existing protection in this country already. We've got um, MPAs and MCZs and SACs and SPAs and AOMBs and triple SIs and all these conservation <laughs> designations. And literally no one understands what they mean. Um, I mean, and there's obvious exceptions to that, the practitioners in the field understand implicitly what they mean and have done since the, you know, a lot of people have worked very hard to get to this point. So there's no disrespect in, in, in what I'm saying really, but to the general public, uh, it doesn't mean anything. So trying to, I think something I've trying to bring to this space is, is to make it palatable to a broader audience. My reason being that if a broader audience, broad audience understand it, they're more likely to care about it and we're more likely to achieve, um, a healthy ocean ultimately okay so the way that it's being communicated at the moment is is a little what like highfalutin like difficult for people to understand conceptual is that is that what you mean yeah deeply i mean i, I think and and as a consequence as a sector it's vastly underfunded um you know right. the, the ocean i think i don't know if these figures are 2020 but i think the ocean gets something like 7% of, um, no, 3% of environmental funding and environmental funding, 7% of total charitable donations. Right. So it's a, it's a tiny landscape um, and it just feels more important than that. Um, so, to, so to my mind, the more people can be engaged in it um, and its protection particularly, um, the more likely it is for that protection to be effective. So your job is, as you see, is to communicate these goals in the in the most effective way possible as part of your as part of your role. So the rewilding thing then was that, um, you know, as I mentioned, I'd never really heard of marine rewilding before seeing the work that you've done. So was that a conscious thing that you brought in, or was there any history of it before in in that space? Oh, uh, I mean, as in as as in like a grafting the concept onto the marine space. I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's there's literally been people working in marine restoration for, for 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 a really long time, but it is very much an emerging space. And I had the idea for rewilding the sea when I I was at the Cambridge Conservation Forum's um, rewilding terrestrial rewilding conference a you know year and a half ago or something, and there was almost no mention of marine because marine basically doesn't really feature in that in that um, that capacity. And so I thought at the time, you know, this is a this is a great opportunity to bring together all of the different people doing things and also connect industry into the, the topic and government into the topic. And a big problem in the UK, uh, we've got um, loads of different maritime agencies, there's six in fact, and people call them the salty six. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I can actually remember who they are, but I think it's the, the Crown Estate Marine Management Organization, Natural England, CFAS, um and defra so those people are the people who manage our sea um and it's to do something like restoring oysters say is incredibly complex it involves lots of different agencies costs quite a lot of money and takes years and years and years so are they are they effectively like governmental quangos if you like yeah they're they're civil servants yeah working on behalf of the right. government exactly Okay, so I imagine, yeah, trying to, I imagine there's a glacial pace trying to get anything through that, uh, through that it, kind of structure, really. Yeah, it is, um, and sometimes really, really disappointing and sort of disenfranchising. But also, you know, there's some wonderful people in the in the in the, in within the institutions themselves. Like, there's some um, fantastically informed and qualified people. I think it's it's just a space that's quite hampered by bureaucracy and part of that is because we don't really understand the sea uh and it's very hard for sure quite quite often evidence is used as a as a way to sort of 
justify business as usual in the sea, I think. Um, you know, we, yeah. we we don't know, we don't have any evidence that, I don't know, the, the yellowfin tuna stock is in, you know, terrible, terrible crisis and therefore we'll keep fishing it to the maximum yield that we set out when it was okay and stuff like that. You know, it's very, it's very hard to measure a lot of this stuff and that can be used as a, a sort of justification to just continue plundering. Right. Well, I mean, that's the theme of um, the environmental conversation generally, isn't it? And it's also one of the arguments that's put against terrestrial rewilding from what I can see, as in it's too disruptive. You know, it's it's going to it's going to affect the, you know, the status quo, like and, and it's going to it's going to mean too much upheaval because if we look, I mean, it might be helpful because terrestrial rewilding is is the more well known you know, sphere that this conversation's going on. So effectively, there's a few, if we look at the UK, I mean, there's a few, fam- the famous one's probably Yellowstone, right? With the, with the wolves. That's the kind of like, the one that most people might have seen the YouTube film and there's been TED Talks about that. And from my amazing research, I learned that the word for that is called, uh, the phrase that is called trophic cascades, which is effectively where you get, reintroductions into an ecosystem that have a very very hugely inf- influential effect on that e- ecosystem and often in a lot of unforeseen ways but essentially it's a regenerative effect right so the so the famous one is yellowstone but then we've got a few in the uk we've got napa state right which is near me yeah which i didn't realize which i'm going to go and have to have a look at and that's where the storks are right yeah i mean that's just a f- fantastic example and isabella tree um um, who, who's um, been, you know, the, the sort of cornerstone of, of the project, along with her husband Charlie Burrell, um, came, came and spoke at our Rewilding the Sea conference and did a sort of fantastic job of showing how, when they started out, they got exactly the sort of criticisms you were mentioning. Um, she had a slide of sort of words people called the project, and it was like you know, outrageous and <laughs> ridiculous and, you know, all, all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, through sticking at it, they've proved, um, you know, r- really a, a fantastic regeneration of that landscape. And um, she pointed to some of the incredible species that they have there and and, and also the um, degree to which it's accepted as good practice now by DEFRA and by the, by the government agencies and how many different landowners around the country um, are considering doing similar things. Um, and I guess terrestrials 15 or 20 years ahead of the marine space. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's, and then there's, there's one, there's Annadale, right? There's one in the lakes. And then there's one, I'm not, is it Sea to Summit? Is that, is that actually, is that happening now? Cause I've, I kind of listened to a few things about that over the last few days, which were from a couple of years ago. Um, and that, so that was a really interesting way of learning about the objections and and effectively the objections. And I know we're not we're talk, your your work is marine rewilding, but obviously it's just a really interesting, as you say, debate about the ethics of this this practice and and what it means for local communities. Um, yeah, the argument seems to well, there's a few there's a few kind of points against it if you like aren't there there's the fact that you know basically well what happens to the existing community that work the land you know what so because one of the big arguments is to rewild the uplands and effectively get rid of sheep farming right and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of very clear arguments why that's a good thing but obviously not for the sheep farmers who you know who've who've worked that land so there's that community argument and then um the the thing that I was reading about today is, was called landlordism as well, which is effectively that um, it it replaces one form of elitist land ownership with another form of elitist land ownership because effectively it's that kind of white savior thing of well a rich white guy is going to buy some land and and save the day and you know but equally that doesn't really help the local community so it's been really interested in learning about how those those issues are being played out in this in this debate um is that something that you come up against with the marine rewilding conversation or is is it is i mean obviously there's a very obvious industry community 
um, area, but is it is it as heated in 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 the area you're working in? Yeah, um, absolutely. I'll I'll come back to that. Um, I just wanted to to say that that yeah that I saw a fantastic debate um, with a Welsh hill farmer. I think he's called Daffod Jones, but I might have that. He's wrong. the guy. He's the guy that I heard speaking about a couple of times. I mean, he's he's, he, he's very convincing. He is, he's incredibly clever. Um, you know, yeah. I, I was I was absolutely overawed um, by by how smart he was, and also his reasoning. You know, he, he, his his point is my family have farmed this land for a very long time. It's extremely difficult being a, a sheep farmer in Wales, but don't you know? No one can come in and suggest we don't know this place because we know it. You know, like the backs of our hands. And, you know, I'm the son of a farmer. I grew up on a farm and I, you know, back when, back when farming was a bit different um, and a bit rougher, probably. Um, <laughs> and, uh, 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 you know, where, where I'm from in Suffolk, it, Suffolk sort of changed a lot um, in terms of farming. But I don't know, I, I, I don't have anything but respect for those individuals, you know, my, or, or that community. Some of my best friends are farmers and and godfather to a farmer's son um and likewise fishermen you know my my dad grew up fishing off the beach in albra and you know i've spent a fair bit of time fishing in my life not commercially um but it, you know in terms of it being a contentious point uh, and and open to criticism i think that's absolutely true and i think where it's possibly failed on land and sea to summit being a good example of this and i you know, I wasn't involved in that project at all. And I don't know anything about it really, but I do know that they they fell foul of criticism of not involving stakeholders uh, uh, properly at an early stage. And, you know, if you're planning on rewilding a tract of, of Welsh uplands that goes through hill farmers' land, those are your stakeholders, you know, and you need to work with them closely. I think fishing, like, fishing's a really interesting one because people say fishermen... And they assume that they're one homogenous and also harmonious lump. Um, you know, you, they, they think that a fisherman is, I, I guess, I, I, you know, I guess before I started, my idea of a fisherman were the people who fish off the boat, off the beach in Albra in Suffolk. And they're, you know, small boats. Some of them are kind of tiny open top boats. And they're usually static gear fishermen, pretty low impact, pretty sustainable. You know, they 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 can fish somewhere like Lime Bay where Blue has a project supports uh, a great number of, of small scale fishermen. And, you know, depending on the gear type, it's an entirely sustainable practice. Um, but fishing has many, many different forms, um, many different scales. Um, and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different types of friction with conservation in different ways. Um, I think what I've always been interested in and part of the reason why I wanted to work for Blue Marine Foundation is they're, they're a pro-fishing charity. You know, it's not it's not an automatic de facto, um, you know, ban all fishing, um, but it's trying to look at ways in which fishermen and, and the marine environment can coexist um, and ways that benefit uh, everyone. And there's obviously a friction there. Um and I think the, the key with any project to make it work is to engage your stakeholders at the start, which is why we had a lot of fishermen at Rewilding the Sea. Um, and we made sure a lot of their questions came to the fore and were put to the environment minister and the other panellists um, because I, it's really important. And for the small scale fishing industry, it's a really tough sector. I mean, something like 25% of small boats last year didn't even get wet. So... It's a, you know, it's a sector that's having a lot of problems. And in the case of Brexit, you know, they, which, which would have been nice not to have touched on, but they, they, um, they, it's inevitable. Yeah. At some point it's always <laughs> going to loom up. Um, yeah. Yeah. This uh, American academic on the phone last night was, uh, was, was mocking me about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, in the case of Brexit, I think fishing has been used in the most atrocious way as it always is um, as a sort of bargaining chip. And all of their aspirations for getting a, you know, a better deal out of Brexit, I just, I just don't see it happening. Um, 
So I'm, I'm really interested in ways in which conservation and fishing can work together, um, not necessarily through alternative livelihoods, although that is something that's going on. You know, a lot of fishermen in other parts of the world have diverged into kelp farming and other types of marine industry when their fish stocks have effectively collapsed. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm interested in ways, ways that low impact fishing and conservation can, can work together. And I think that's the, that's the future especially somewhere like the UK where there's a, a big coastal population there's a lot of fishermen obviously in places like New Zealand or you know s to s some other countries where there isn't fishing at all uh, or, or any sort of you know fishing that directly benefits people on the shoreline then I then I don't see in you know like the high seas for instance most fishing out there is completely uneconomical it's just afforded by subsidies uh, and there's a bunch of low hanging fruit like that that I think I think should just be shut to fishing, partly to you know protect the, the ecosystem forever because it supports you know all life on Earth, um, and partly because it in, will improve fish stocks immeasurably in other places. Um, you know, it's closing the high seas, closing Antarctica, stopping fishing in those places where we shouldn't really be fishing anyway. I don't see any impediment to that apart from profit. Um, and it's not even a huge amount of profit. Yeah. So, I mean, what you've described is the great challenge of any environmental idea or movement, really, isn't it? Like how you build a consensus, how you balance the stakeholders, how you make sure there's a place for community, whatever that, whatever form that takes, whether it's local industry, whether it's people that live on the land, whether it's, you know, the Welsh farmer we talked about. Um, so yeah so you've built that into the conversation from the beginning by the sounds of it to try and use your conversation to explore those relevant issues to you as you go along so i guess a couple of questions on that then firstly um what is you what is the vision for for marine rewilding in the uk firstly and then secondly what are the issues like you know what 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 are these difficulties that you need to overcome to achieve that vision yeah, good questions. Um, so, I guess lots of lots of different people have probably have quite different vision visions for where we could get to. Um, the, there's a global aspiration to protect thirty percent of ocean by twenty thirty, and protect is the key word there because obviously, you know, you can say someone's protected. Um, and yet its protection is completely meaningless. Um, and that's the case with a lot of uh, designations at the moment. Um, I think where it, where it gets really interesting um, is restoration of habitats. Um, a, a, you know, there's two, there's two sort of strands here. Well, three strands really. There's protection, restoration and sustainable management. You know, the, the protection uh, conversation is... You know, the, the UK has actually made a lot of headway on that basis. We're fortunate in that we've got these uh, islands around the world, each of which have 200 miles of sea around them. So we have the fifth largest marine estate in the world. Um, and I, I don't know, before I sort of got into this space, I had these places in my head as I didn't really think about what they were, but places like Ascension Island and St. Helena and, you know, rightfully or wrongfully whether we we own those those islands we do and we have 200 miles of sea around each one um and the uk government's made a lot of headway um in in protecting some of them um uh, certainly there could you know your the the criticism of landlordism could potentially be levied certainly at one of them um so yeah i mean there's protection and, and i think there's quite a clear global vision and i think there's a lot of people marching towards that and a lot of people trying to accomplish that 30 percent target which is what leading scientists agree you need for a healthy sustainable ocean in perpetuity you know if you protect that amount of ocean properly then it can keep the rest of it healthy um i think when it comes to climate change and climate change um, mitigation and adaptation I think the restoration of marine habitats is there's an incredible amount of poten potential there that's only just emerging and I, I can't really speak to this in the tropics because I don't know anything about mangroves I don't have any involvement in tropical con conservation 
there's a fantastic um, leader of an organisation, a guy called Ali Harris from Blue Ventures. And if you do want to know more about that, he, he's the man to speak to because he understands it much better. But closer to home, we've got extraordinary habitat like seagrass um, and salt marsh um, and kelp, all of which perform you know, the function of locking away and storing carbon um, and all of which could bring about huge benefits um, if their restoration can be done at a larger scale. Um, so it's, I see that as being a, a key vision that that becomes part of the world's climate claim, change commitments, that blue carbon sort of makes it onto the agenda um, in, in the years to come. Whether that will happen or not, I think the complexity is as we touched on before is that it's, it's quite hard to measure all this stuff um and you know if you if you restore uh 100 acres of seagrass it, you know does it stay there does it you know get destroyed by something in the future and therefore lose its functions does it get destroyed by bad weather etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean it's all kind of it, it's a complex field definitely um yeah but i see i see a lot of potential for for marine rewilding in terms of habitat in terms of species reintroduction i think it's a it's a complicated field and one that's you know it needs an incredible amount of work to do it well and my my great friend rory moore who i work with is trying to reintroduce sturgeon to the to the uh to the rivers of england starting with the seven um and you just, there were once kind of quite bountiful populations of of giants, you know, um, uh, Atlantic sturgeon in our waters. And, you know, there's, there's almost none now. Um, if there are any, they come across from the Danube and other places. So, yeah, he, he's got a project to do that. And it'd be fascinating to see how that emerges and whether he can actually get that to happen. And it's almost like this, this sort of, you know, inappropriate word to use but like the sexy end of rewilding isn't it the kind of reintroduction of species it's the main way it's communicated it's it's the thing that people can latch onto, isn't it you know wolves in yellowstone bears in the pyrenees you know lynx in 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 the uk like so yeah i guess i guess it is and if you know if, for communicating as well it's, it's a really effective kind of tool isn't it to to help people grasp it so with with the conference what what did you did any new challenges arise did you did you just did you find you know did did you come out of it thinking that there were things that you you know that, that you learned about how how you're gonna have to approach this in a different way yeah there were i mean one of the sort of um one of the goals there was recently a, a review in the uk about highly protected marine areas and those are areas from which um all um activities excluded apart from recreational diving and, and and recreational boating and and that was for english waters only the review was focused on not not the broader uk um and yeah that was you know that was something that was discussed um uh, you know in detail and also was uh, kind of interrogated in a breakout room with um a, a bunch of fishermen and a bunch of anglers um, and a bunch of different stakeholders. And I think it's the closest, you know, that, that review is the closest we've come to having those protect that type of protection in the UK for a very long time. They tried to do it about 10 years, a bit more than 10 years ago, and it didn't really work. Um, and they did the classic thing of not really engaging the stakeholders and, and a, right. a lot of the sites proposed fell apart. Um, and it, it didn't, it didn't come together and as a result we've got a, a tiny tiny percentage of our waters properly well highly protected i mean something like 0.001 percent or something um and i think it's a shame because there's a, there's a tremendous opportunity there that actually could benefit fishermen and benefit anglers too um and it was really interesting to see that come up um and sort of be publicly discussed because it's not something that gets discussed very much and it will be really interesting to see where that goes the government was meant to uh, announce five pilot sites in the review but they had to pull back from that because of covid um, and, the, and the chaos that caused um, and it'll be really interesting to see whether 
and how quickly they commit to actually you know doing five sites and and you know how they learn from past failures and actually work with all of the people from the very start to show the potential benefits to them um and it'll be interesting to see that process unfold um i i dare say there will be lots of challenges yeah because it's it, so what it's one thing to just ha- have an island and suddenly declare you know which is hardly used by anyone and declare it as protected it's quite another thing to try and protect areas in in bits of sea with a lot of stakeholders yeah sure like the uk for example yeah like like the vast majority of of of, of definitely english waters yeah 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 um so have you got a roadmap have you got have you got like a you know could you could you outline the kind of the plan as it as it stands right now yeah i mean we've well we've got we've got various different plans um across various different various different projects i mean so something like the marine parks um uh, uh campaign that i'm working on I, I see that very much as being a 10 year thing um the first one um was brought to life by the city of plymouth last year um they got 70 different stakeholders to agree that they would like a national park in the sea uh, around plymouth sound now they're going through the process which will probably take a year or so um to determine what that means um but our vision for that effectively is to start those conversations in 10 different places over the next three years and i'm going to launch a report in august um that's been conducted for us by natasha bradshaw who's a, a sort of bit of a marine parks guru um and our goal in the future would be that you know we have a network of national parks in the sea around the uk um that you know are agreed on by local people um and bring a huge amount of value to coastal communities um basically yeah through through people identifying and understanding the sea better i mean i heard you say um before that you have a national park on your on your doorstep kind of thing that must be awesome yeah it's well, i mean it's amazing yeah and i guess that almost i mean so yeah i mean i'm really lucky i've got south downs on my doorstep i can literally be up on the downs from my house in fact i went so i went for my really unenjoyable run <laughs> earlier um <laughs> uh yeah like i can be up there in like five minutes yeah and you know you do you do take those places for granted in in a lot of ways so is it is it do they exist in the uk in a marine context oh so that so that the only um there's a long history about this um so national parks came to life immediately following world war ii um but the campaign to get to that point was long it was 20 something years and the national park so this is like your south the south downs like yeah, it's, it's, exactly yeah, yeah. yeah you, 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 like i guess the lake district the, is one and yeah yeah sure yeah yeah and there's, there's a number around the uk and they the language of the national parks act of 1949 is actually really beautiful because I think they'd just come out of the war and they suddenly realized how precious all this stuff was and how important yeah. it was. And the, and the language is, is, is really, really lovely. And it, it, you know, their goal was to conserve and enhance the, the beauty of, 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 of England uh, and, and Scotland and Wales. And at the start of the, that campaign, there was a lot of Marine elements and funnily enough, places like the Isles of Scilly were in the initial um plans but as it got closer to time i guess because we saw the sea so differently then all of the marine elements just fell by the wayside and there is specific provision for silly to to actually be a marine park in the future um a, a national park based on its marine features um so yeah i mean it's and we're obviously 70 years forward from that point um and we have a whole load of things in the sea that are supposed to protect it. But I think uh, our, our sort of embarkation point for this is they don't really work and no one understands them. Um, so that's sort of what we're trying to overcome. And I guess with, with the taking the sort of term of a national park into the sea, you know, the, the obviously 
the obvious question is, you know, what does it do with what's already there in terms of protection? And we don't really see this as trying to strip anything away from anyone. We we more so see it as a way to make a better whole out of the, the sum of the parts. I mean, that was going to be my next question, really. Like, what, what, what will be the benefits to a place like Plymouth? You know, awareness, obviously, I'm guessing tourism must be another persuasive argument for it. Yeah, there's a couple of, I mean, so the um, Jurassic Heritage Coast, when they rebranded and signposted the the coastal, that, that whole coast, they they got something extraordinary like an additional £110 million of tourist revenue every year. So that there's obviously that benefit, but I think it goes a little deeper than that. Um, it, you know, in, in Plymouth, as, as in our, the whole of our country, but, you know, it's, something like one in five children have never been to the beach uh which you know if you live in land uh or, or far in land then then that's one thing but you know living in a city like plymouth which is effect calls itself britain's ocean city you know you know it's it's right there it's extraordinary that you know there's there's pockets in the north of the city where where kids have never been to the beach and and you know i think it's 17 percent or something in plymouth um that's quite staggering isn't it it's quite mind blowing, really, and and also really tragic. So, you know, I think I, I see this as as a way, um, and you know, I, I probably am quite naive and optimistic about it because I, I don't think it will solve any any of those. You know, I don't think it, I don't think there's there's a silver bullet for any of this stuff. But I I would love to think that it could give people in coastal areas a a, a renewed sense of pride and a sense of interest and excitement about the marine environment drive greater investment um you know i guess just that there's a load of interesting data on national parks and the benefits health and well-being benefits of living in a national park or near a national park and how people feel about national parks um and i'd i'd hope that it could you know help to drive that sort of thing in in coastal communities many of which are pretty pretty deprived so what was your route into this? How long have you been with the foundation? Um, yeah, good question really. I mean, I I I was sort of moonlighting for them for a while while I was while I was doing doing a slightly more commercial job and um and then I've I've been there full time um for 5 years now. Um and I came to I was I was up in the Orkney Islands and I I had this this quite strange time where I sort of um, found myself with no responsibility, which is so rare, you know, and I'd, I'd sort of a flat came to an end and I re- wanted to get out of the company I was working with and relationship meltdown. And I was suddenly like, hold on a second, I'm completely free. Um, so I decided to just go surfing for a while. And I, I went up to the Orkney Islands with a friend and, and I spent a f- good couple of months up there, maybe almost three months. And and the island uh, we, were, we were on is pretty... Um, it's pretty fickle, you know, there's a couple of good waves and there's a couple of really good waves, but they don't break that much. And there was a lot of down days and, and I had a, you know, mask and snorkel with me and, um, and fins and stuff. And I didn't have a weight belt cause I didn't really know anything about it then, but I was sort of spent quite a lot of time free diving and by free diving, I mean like diving about five foot below the surface and having a poke around. Um, but what I saw an encounter was, just a huge volume of much bigger species than I'd ever seen before anywhere else. Like, you know, huge turbot and um, an abundance of seals that, you know, like sometimes be surfing some of the little slabs there and there'd be like 20 seals looking at me. Um, And I guess I'd, you know, I'd been surfing, I've been surfing for, 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 for a long time. And I, I sort of, I'd never really encountered that abundance or I probably had in, you know, when in California, when you see the sea otters or, you know, in, in Australia, when you see the humpbacks or, you know, I've, I've seen some pretty interesting stuff over the years, but I'd never sort of just grounded in it and been going slowly enough to really notice it. And I was suddenly like, this is incredible and so different to what I'm used to in Cornwall. And this is more like what a healthy ecosystem looks like. And of course, the Orkneys have been fished for ever and fished very heavily. So it's it's by no means like a sort of kind of marine wilderness. Um, and I've been to some, some more interesting ones since, but I sort of, yeah, it was just this moment where I was like, 
this is this is incredible and this is what it should be like and I feel like that would be a really good way to spend my time and that's how I sort of came to it and it's been awesome I've 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 really loved it um ever since I guess it's a sort of perfect culmination of your interests right because you know I originally knew of you as a writer um but somebody who specialized in you know in, in you know you write about the sea surfing you know um yeah it makes sense as a kind of great you know nexus of those interests really where you could you could kind of put it put it all into in, into like a really positive direction not that it wasn't positive before but you know what i mean like it has it has that definite kind of giving back aspect to it is that you, you mentioned you grew up by the coast you know is that is it always been something that's guided y- your path yeah i guess so um i mean it, i grew up with i grew up in that maddening and i think you, you'll understand this um somewhere where your sort of desire <laughs> to to get waves is much more than the actual waves that you get but the and, and that can be quite frustrating i was i was thinking about it a couple of days ago actually how I just used to make my dad drive me to the beach all the time when I was a kid. And I don't know whether he had it, but do you remember that wave fax uh, thing? You could you could sort of fax a, a premium rate <laughs> number and it would sort of beam through this like fax. And I can remember going through it and I'd always see like fistral <laughs> six foot and then it would go all the way around the coast and then it would be like you know, red car or whatever, three foot, and then it would be like chroma one foot, and then it would be Suffolk yeah. where I was, it would just be flat, like lowest off flat, yeah. and it was always flat. <laughs> and uh, and I, um, I had all these like arcane sort of waves that I thought I knew when there'd be waves, like, you know, the wind would be blowing a certain way or like, you know, in a certain strength, and I'd sort of force my dad to take me to the beach, you know, long, long before I could drive when I was, was really little, and you know, I was totally obsessed with it and I didn't really understand, you know, I just used to go, you know, as far out the back as I, as I, as I could get and then sort of just go straight really fast. I didn't really have any cultural references at all. I was just really obsessed with it. And my, my cousin in Australia was like a, a serious surf dude. And I, um, I just wanted to be him basically. And, um, yeah, he, he's, he's a, he's a real, you know, hero to me. And I sort of, yeah, I just wanted to be him, and and but I, you know, it was pretty tragic, really. <laughs> Free, oh, you need freezing. them. <laughs> you need them, though, don't you? You need those, especially. You know, we're probably a similar age, right? And you, you know, you need, you need that. Like, it's not like it was that common back then. So you need, you need those people that, you know, you're like, oh wow, so you can, you can do that. And how, so, how about the, the, like, so was w- writing and journalism? Is it was that your career as as well as you mentioned you've done work for a couple of companies was were you making a living from from writing as well yeah i mean i i I probably like pretty failed pretty badly to make a living ever make a living from writing um (laughs) i i sort of did give it a try i just that just that just proves you're a writer though doesn't it (laughs) yeah maybe i don't know (laughs) i uh yeah i've always sort of i've always sort of I'd, i'd love to say that it's ideological and i you know, I get more joy from writing if I don't do it as my full-time job, but it's probably that I just need more money than writing's ever been able to provide. And I, I've always loved doing it. Like I can remember doing it when I was a little kid, like writing things in response to, to what, whatever was happening. And, you know, I, I guess, yeah, feeling like, feeling like it was a really precious thing. And, you know, my mum, my mum's a doctor of, of English and American literature. And my wife actually has just handed in her PhD. I mean, I don't know why I was, drawn to 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 an academic you know and and it's something words have always been like a big part of my life you know I've I've always read a lot and my mum sort of forced lots of books on me when I was little and weirdly enough I didn't lose it like most things that are forcing you when you're a child and yeah it's just always been a something that I've really loved doing and I I don't know I've sort of I I feel like it's forms a lot of my working life now like a lot of the stuff I do is really writing you know whether it's writing um you know letters to people or or proposals or trying to inform policy or you know whatever different area of of conservation I'm working on that I use that skill all day day in day out and and I really enjoy it um 
is something that I I see it as very much as a lifelong thing and I have what well, I have this aspiration to one day just stop doing everything else and just write you know write a couple of books but I never seem to I always seem to be too distracted to do that <laughs> I mean what I really like about your work is you you do explore that you know these days it's there's a huge interest and there obviously always has been but there's a real thing about the human relationship to the sea and and what what it means and you know what how you can gain strength from it how you can gain you know even to the point of like positive positive mental health you know it's, it's obviously just a huge conversation now especially in our communities and you know your work has always really eloquently spoken to that conversation you know which is whether it's like the stuff you did with Finisterre like the films you know the the the, the work I've read in the you know because you've had stuff printed in all the surf mags like you know backwash obviously you're a huge part of I mean you know that was that was the lens through which you guys were looking at surfing really wasn't it with back backwash you know like yeah it's surfing but it's everything around it as well it's 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 the environment and it's the human relationship to that and that you can see that in this work now you know you can see as you mentioned the human connection that you're yeah you know this work is is about the natural world but as you've made clear it's it's as important to to work out how it can work for for people as well so is that is that been a have you realized that has that been a conscious thing is that is that theme yeah i i think that i probably not until now but yeah <laughs> i'm down with it you know that's definitely yeah that's definitely what i'm trying to deal with even though i, I guess yeah it just seems like a lot of this stuff happens but i'm backwash was and I say was because, and I shouldn't say was because a new one's about to come out, and you know Chris, oh, great. Chris and Matt have been, you know, working away really hard, and <clears throat> I just had a had a glimpse of it actually a couple of days ago, and it looks amazing, and I'm gonna you know try and try and add a little bit in, but I've I've had three children in the last three years, so I've I've been slightly um un, yeah you're un, allowed <laughs> yeah I haven't really had much of a chance to um to be involved in the last issue um and you know it's it's taken a it's taken a, a while longer we were planning to do one a year but it's sort of yeah i think it's been a couple of years but also i can remember someone saying to me in the surfing industry a few years ago you know why do you guys even do that that backwash thing like why does it even exist and you know is it you know are you, are you trying to make you know you're going to try and make money out of it are you, uh, and that was sort of that was exactly the point of doing it just yeah of course just because it yeah just because of that you know and and we that's I, so funny because that, <laughs> that you know that was that was obviously the point yeah, exactly. we, we just wanted to get rich <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah the grand plan <laughs> yeah that, that old plan and and i think that's yeah that's sort of got been a great theme. idea lads yeah <laughs> that's been a that's been a theme as well like a lot of the things that have sort of drawn me in terms of pursuits like put you know poetry is the ultimate like the the, the, the ultimate, ultimate get rich quick scheme it's, yeah it's such <laughs> what a, everyone thinks it's such a bummer <laughs> i mean i can remember i think i think the first time i ever got paid for it was by finisterre for edge of sanity and i got a few hundred quid and i was stoked but i can remember it was almost exactly, I mean, that's that's a, that's a win <laughs> yeah massive win and i can remember i can remember thinking like i think it was that was 15 years after i'd started writing poetry and I reckon I'd written like probably a thousand poems, <laughs> and that was like my sum total earnings. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty lame, but I I don't know. I I love it. It's, I don't really write poetry anymore. It just doesn't seem to come out. But I think it it did for a long time, and it was a really fun thing. I mean, I, I think it's it doesn't really land with people, you know. I, I often think I should have just become a photographer because then you can tell the story so easily. But yeah, poetry's a yeah, it's a funny pursuit. Um, and yeah, I think, I think writers, I mean, I think writers are sort of destined to, you know, it's not, it's not really a financial game and, and there's a certain beauty in that maybe. Um, yeah, it's a purity, isn't it? That's what I was going to say. Like, I think, I, I just like the idea as it sounds like you're describing that, you know, you can have a creative outlet for a while and then maybe you'll move on to a different thing. But as long as you're following your interests and as long as it's, not get rich not the old poetry get rich quick scheme and you know like because that because that because that shows doesn't it when 
when that's at the root of it i think i think that's i guess that's what i'm getting at really like there's a the theme is the thing you know that's what you can discern in what you've done and through these various projects and that that's important to to have that honesty at the heart of any type of creativity isn't it because that's when you get good work and ultimately who cares if people don't see it really you know it's not obviously not why why you're doing it, is it yeah I, I yeah i guess i guess not i mean i guess when i started i i was like oh, i you know i love nothing more to than to be published in the surface journal that was a real like thing i i always wanted to do and and you know when i when i got there i was like oh wow you know that that's great i've I've really, you know, achieved achieved that thing that I wanted to do. But I don't know, like even that magazine, which I love and, and respect and I love getting work in it and I love getting, you know, I love reading it. I don't particularly like reading my work in it or seeing it. Like it's never really been about that. And I've, I remember going to a couple of the different back, because we used to do a backwash issue and then we'd have a good party afterwards um, to sort of launch it. And I can remember going to a couple of the parties and just coming away without a copy <laughs> and not really seeing it for a few months. And that wasn't really premeditated. I always was like, oh, damn, I wish I'd got a copy. But I kind of, yeah, I never really, I never really cared about actually getting the final thing back. I really enjoy the journey. And Backwash was awesome like that because it, it's such a nice crew. I mean, you, you've you've covered a few of them on, on the podcast, um, like Chris and, and Noah, you know. It was just a great little group and um, good people and, you know, a lot of them are like, you know, we're, we're, we're quite stratospherically different as surfers, you know, the sort of waves that Noah's into and the sort of waves I'm <laughs> into are quite, quite yeah, different. Yeah, Noah, Noah can keep them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> 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 but they're just one, they're just a wonderful crew and, and very, very different. And, and, you know, I, I hope that that project, even if it ends up not being a magazine and, we keep doing different things and, and collaborating. It was ni- nice to have a community because quite often it's, yeah, it's quite solo. And I guess quite a lot of my surfing life has been quite solo as well. I mean, I sort of, I quite like surfing by myself and that's always been something I've been quite drawn to. So it's quite nice to have a little little crew. Yeah. So we've covered quite a lot of stuff there really with your work. So where can people see, see your work? Obviously you mentioned the foundation, um, there's there's quite a lot of recaps online of the conference, isn't there, which people can can see as well. Um, yeah, so where where should we point people so they can find out more about the things we've discussed and also more about your work? Um, yeah, Re- Rewilding Britain did a really nice write up of of the conference. Um, I think we're going to release a report on it in a couple of weeks that we published. If you don't follow Blue Marine Foundation on on um, instagram and twitter it's it's well worth following them and you know that they're one charity among many many others in this space there's loads of amazing people doing amazing work um and you know as sort of sea people um there's there's a whole there's a whole landscape out there of 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 interesting stuff going on so yeah i think blue blue would open an interesting journey to people you know looking into this space um and yeah i i you know i I'd love to say I had a kind of active social media presence or a regularly updated website or anything, but I, you know, tragically don't. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think, yeah, uh, there's a whole load of really, really exciting work coming out within, within my work with Blue Marine Foundation in the next few years. We've just signed off on a, th- on a kind of three year um, project to do all sorts of cool stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about the future and, you know, hopefully we can achieve these big ocean goals in the next 10 years. Um, yeah, I, I see it very, see, I don't see myself leaving this space, you know, at all for, for a long time. It feels like there's a almost endless amount of work to do. So there you go. That was me in conversation with Dan Crockett. Hope you like that one. If you want to find out more about the work of the Blue Marine Foundation, you can find it at bluemarinefoundation.com. If you want to find out more about Dan's work, including his various creative and writing projects, head to his website, www.danielcrockett, that's with two T's, .co.uk. Now, I'll also be posting links on my newsletter, which you can subscribe to over at my website, www.wearelookingsideways.com. I send the newsletter out every fortnight. It features the 10 things I think are worth sharing that week. 
Um, people are enjoying it very much. I've got quite a few thousand people subscribed to that one now. There's no spam. It's just interesting stuff. I think if you enjoy what I do on the podcast, you're going to enjoy the newsletter. I'll also be sharing links to Dan and the Blue Marine Foundation's work over at Twitter at We Look Sideways. Nice one. As you probably know, I release new episodes of Type 2 every month or so. And they'll appear in my usual Looking Sideways channel, which you can subscribe to via Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any of your other podcast purveyors. If it's your first time checking out what I do, make sure you get stuck into the back catalogue. Got 120, probably over 130 actually episodes of interviews with some of the biggest and most interesting names in action sports and other related endeavours. All right. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. Nice one. Mm -hmm.